All righty, good morning. So today we will be covering trigonometry, which is unit five of this class. So first question that we will be looking at here has to do with Pythagorean triples. All right, Pythagorean triples correlate directly on to whether to gauge if a set of numbers will make a right triangle or not. When you're talking about a right triangle, we can mostly associate which formula? One more time. Excellent, Pythagorean's theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So we would go ahead and plug these sets of numbers in with the largest number being our, well, in this first case, yes, hypotenuse. So it'd be five squared plus 12 squared equals 13 squared. Next, you would have eight squared plus 15 squared equals 17 squared. And lastly, you would have seven squared plus 24 squared equals 25 squared. From here, five squared is 12 squared is, and 13 squared is. So make sure you're following along of a calculator so you can do these fairly quickly. 169, excellent. So when you add 25 plus 144, it will give you 169, which equals 169, meaning that this indeed is a right triangle. Eight squared is, 15 squared is, and 17 squared is, 64 plus 225 is, does 289 equal 289? Then yes, the world is at peace. This is a right triangle. Seven squared, all right, 24 squared. Excellent work. And then 25 squared would be 625. 49 plus 576. Excellent. So does 625 equal 625? Is this a right triangle? Yes, Pythagorean triples all around. Any questions on this? No problem. Go ahead. You've got a sec. So next we'll be talking about special right triangles. Does that bring anything to mind when I say those words? Nope. Excellent. What kind of triangles would fall under that category? Let's apply some memory there. OK, potentially. Um, not particularly, no. So for special right triangles, you'd be talking about either 45, 45, 90 triangles in this case, or as in you'll see in the next one, 30, 60, 90. So particularly here, when you're talking about a 45, 45, 90 triangle, you can classify it as what kind of triangle? Right triangle. A right triangle and also a what? So you told me the angle measure side of it, but now classify it through side lengths. If you're classifying side lengths here, you would say that this is a isosceles. isosceles. We know this because if you were to draw this out, if you were to draw this out, right, it would look like the following. First, there's two ways to gauge it. It says that the legs are five centimeters, right? And then it also says that this is 45 and 45. So if you remember the converse of the isosceles triangle theorem, it states that if two angles in a triangle are congruent, then the side lengths opposite to it are also going to be congruent. 
So before I give you the answers on this, I want to show you the methoding and the rules for it. So tell, uh... Well, not necessarily not for special right triangles. That comes for when you have reference angles. So here in this case, what you would look at is when you don't know the value of something in math, what do you label it as? X, right? So if this is X, this must be X as well because they are congruent. Well, they're going to be. I thought, I'm trying to show you guys the rules first. So since both of these are X, now we know in geometry, if in a right triangle, I have two of the side lengths, what can I do to find the third? Yep. You would plug it into Pythagorean theorem. So that would look like X squared plus X squared equals C squared. Because X is covering for A and X is covering for B, yes? So X squared plus X squared is 2X squared. Remember, X4 would be the result of X squared times X squared. When you're adding them, you would put the variables together. So now here, are we solving for C or C squared? Well, right now we have C squared, but we're solving for C because the triangle would be A, B, and C, right? So therefore here, in order to get rid of a square, I must square root both sides. So this would cancel, and then C equals, is two a perfect square? Give me two numbers that are the same that when you multiply, I give you two. No, so two would have to stay inside. Is X squared a perfect square? Yes, it's a perfect square of X. So the result would be X radical two. Guys, does the value of X change ever in one question? In one question, it would always be the same result, right? So therefore here, if it says that X is five, that means that my hypotenuse is going to be five radical two. And that would be that final answer. Wait, but technically, can't you, um, can't you do five squared plus five squared equals X squared and then solve it? And then to do is then you get um so you're saying if I had it if you if you were just gonna go directly off the rules, yeah, you would say five squared plus five squared equals c squared. Five squared is twenty-five, twenty-five, c squared, fifty, right? Square root, square root, square root of fifty. Oh crap, we know is gonna be um, 7.07. Well, you wouldn't you wouldn't do it that way. You would have to do the factoring method. So 50 is 2 times 25. 25 is 5 times 5. So the rule is if you have a partner, you can come out and play. So 5 would go outside, 2 would stay inside because 2 has no partner. So it still gives you the same result. Oh. Don't you just square root it and actually get the decimal? Well, you can, but that would not be precise. That would be rounding, right? So and that later on in the future, when you get to circles, is proven that you don't want to do until the very end, because let's say you're a theme park attraction engineer, right? And you round every track, every piece of a track for a roller coaster. You round it up and you round it up and you round it up and you round it up. What ends up happening to your, your roller coaster? Well, it's now longer than you originally gauged for, so you're going to either have cars flying out or people dying left and right because the track is off its course. OK, moving forward. Now we're talking about a dun, 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 dun. give me one second here. Thirty, sixty, ninety triangle, yes. And does anyone remember the rule for a 30, 60, 90 triangle? Well, the rule is as easy as counting to one, two, radical three. Right? The rule is one, two, radical three. What I mean by that is opposite of your 30 
will be one. Opposite of your 90 will be two. And opposite of your 60 will be radical three. Once again, whenever we don't know the value for a variable, we use x. So x, x, sorry, x, 2x, and x radical 3. So that is the ruling for a 30, 60, 90 triangle, yes? And here it's telling you that the hypotenuse is 68, right? So if it's both 68 and 2x, what can I do to them? Well, yes, but first I would have to set them equal to one another. Right? And then here I divide both sides by two. And now X equals 34. Is there an X value on this rule sheet here? Yes, right? Opposite of my 30 would be my X, so I can replace that for 34. I've already replaced this for 68 which means that this value is going to be what? 68 Well, if we know X is 34, can I just replace this? And giving me a value of? Jesus Christ, thank you. Oh my God, stop clicking. 34 radical three would be your answer here. Now it says to confirm your answer using Pythagorean's theorem, right? So once again, in Pythagorean's theorem, C represents our hypotenuse. So it would be placed as 34 squared plus 34 radical three squared equals 68 squared. 34 squared is 11. 56, 34 radical three squared, we would count it as 34 times three squared, right? So 34 squared is 11, 56 times, radical three times radical three is radical nine. So the square root of nine we know is three. So now 11, 56 times three would give you uh, can someone fact check me on that? I think it is 3648. Yeah. Or 3468. There you go. Sorry, my dyscalculia kicked in. 3468 and then 68 squared would be 4624. Right? So 1156 plus 3468 is. 46, 24. So do both of these equal out? Does 46, 24 equal 46, 24? Then yes, this is a right triangle and the rules do apply. Is everyone following along? Any questions you might have for me? All righty then, onward. Now here, let me um, zoom this in a little bit for you guys. Give me one second. Can you all see that all right? Yes, excellent. So it says consider the following figure. First here, we're talking about trig functions. Can you guys tell me what trig functions you remember off the top of your head? Yes, there you go. The moment you've been waiting for. <laughs> so, ka, toa. And what exactly does that stand for? Well, the S represents sine, sine which equals um, the opposite of the hypotenuse. Excellent. Cosine represents um, adjacent over the hypotenuse. And lastly, we have tangent. tangent which represents all right so now from these we can look at our figure here and 
find first our theta, or also known as our what? Well, that would be our reference angle, which in this case is 18, right? So from here, we can go ahead and label our triangle. Across from 18 will always be our opposite, right? So this is opposite. We can label that. Across from our 90 degree angle is always our hypotenuse. And then that would leave our third side length, which is X to be adjacent. Now that we have these labels, we can go ahead and figure out what we need to work with. So the first one is asking us which trig function we need to use. So when you look at all three questions though, it says value of X, find X, value of X, right? So what are we not looking for ever here? Y. We're not looking for Y, nor are we using it, right? That would mean that we've used um, cosine because it doesn't contain the opposite. Exactly. Because it does not use our opposite, we can now get rid of both functions that do use it. Right? So we don't have our opposite. We're going to go ahead and switch to cosine as the answer for A for the trig function. And now when we set up that equation, it would look like cosine of what angle? 18 equals what's my adjacent x over 25 5. now in order to solve for x i must multiply 25 into both sides this will cancel out here and then 25 times cosine 18 is how you would plug it into your calculator but the last step you have to make sure you do is click the Second button. Equal button, right? So if you do not click enter at the end, you will only see the 0.95 something number, which is going to be cosine of 18, and that is not. Huh? That's only if you're doing that. Yeah, if you're doing the inverse, then you would do the second button. So what would that final value be? One more time? 450? Um, OK, so one more time, how you would plug it into your calculator is 25 times, times 18, 18, 18 cosine equals. equals. So technically the 16.5 if you were. What number did you put in? I put in 25. All right, make sure you're on degrees. Oh. If you're not in degrees, you might be the number might be off. It should be 23.8. Um, as the final, because you'd be rounding to the nearest tenth, right? Were you on degree, sir? Oh, no, I wasn't. Okay. So remember, that's the first thing you have to do every time you turn on the calculator. Wait, what's this? The rad, radians. Radiance and gradients. So radiance is what we learned at the end here at circles when we convert from pi to, I mean, from terms of pi to degrees and degrees and so on. All right, next step here. It says, suppose that you are standing at the top of a hill, 59.5 feet up. Oh, I can zoom out here, right? So 59.5 feet and here I am. Oh, standing too tall, evidently. Standing tall and I'm staring down. Oh my God, that's a terrible line. Well, first we know that my line of sight is always horizontal, right? Because it's always straight ahead. And then I have an angle of depression here staring down at a lake at 48 degrees. Here's the lake, right? I should have made it blue, but instead we have a blood of pool. Sorry, pool of blood. <laughs> All right, and now we're trying to find out how far we are from the lake. Yes? So from here, you must first figure out again since he is standing straight on top of the top of the hill and he has a horizontal line of sight we know that this whole angle measures so if this is horizontal it must be intercepting at a <laughs> yes yes 90 degrees so if this is 90 degrees and this is 48 i must 
in order to find this angle, I would subtract 48 from 90. So 90 minus 48 equals 42. Wait, no, I, I thought the thing from the, um, from the lake to X would be like, because you know what I mean? Where like, and where X is and where the angle is. Uh, well, the angle is up here, right? Because you, you're going off of the line of sight from the, oh, well, the person. What I, what I was thinking is that this angle would be 48. This angle, well, it is if you're looking at alternate interiors. Um, but since you're talking about the distance, either one would work. Because you have to remember that sine and cosine are going to be supplemental, right? Um, so now here. Uh, sorry, complementary is the word I was looking for. Here we would set it up as, are we looking for our hypotenuse? No, do we have our hypotenuse? No, right? So since that is the case, we can get rid of which two functions? Which two functions do we know use hypotenuse? Cosine and? Sine. Since both of those use hypotenuse, we can do away with them and know that we're going to stick with tangent 42, right? Because that's the angle that we're talking about here. Equals adjacent is, I'm sorry, opposite is x, and then my adjacent is 59.5. So now in order to get uh, X alone, I must multiply both sides by 59.5. This will cancel out. And then you would plug it into your calculator the same way you did the last one, and your result would be X equals what? Remember, you're rounding your answer to the nearest foot. So it would go in as 59.5 times 42 tangent, and do not forget to select the equals button. Um, 53.6. So remember, round to the nearest foot. 53.6. Oh, nearest foot. Where is it? Um, that'd be 54. That would be 54. Oh, very good. So you plug it into the calculator as 59.5 times 42 tangent, and make sure you click the equals button. I can move forward. All righty. The next question here states that if Lionel has an eye level of five feet because he's standing tall. Wow, there's a terrible line. Of five feet, and he is standing 40 feet away from a flagpole. Nobody said it was an American flag. I never said it was an American flag either. And then here, the flagpole is standing at a mighty 32 feet tall, right? Now, what are we looking for? We are looking for the angle of elevation. We're gonna label that as X degrees, yes? Now with the information given here, I can go ahead and set up a ratio. So once again, am I looking for my hypotenuse? No. Do I have my hypotenuse? No. So therefore, I can get rid of which two functions? Sine and cosine, therefore, leaving me with tangent. Guys, when you are dealing with questions of angle of depression and angle of elevation, 95% of the time, you will be dealing with a tangent function. All right, so keep that in mind moving forward. So here would be tangent of X equals what? Y5. Remember, you're dealing with this triangle here. 
32, are we sure about that number? Where is the flagpole standing? Is it standing on the ground? Or is it standing on the kid's forehead? It's standing on the ground, right? So it can't be 32 feet because the kid is looking at it from five feet above. Five feet above. So you would have to do what? 32 minus five to get 27. So 27 over 40 would be the new ratio. And now in order to solve for X, you would have to multiply tangent by inverse tangent on both sides. And that means that these would cancel out and X would equal inverse tangent 27 over 40. Now how you would plug that into your calculator is as follows. Click 27. Now in the bottom left corner of your calculator, there is an ABC button. Click that. Select 40 so that you can have your fraction set up. Then click the green second button. And you would click tangent to get an answer of. 34 would be absolutely right. Any questions thus far? All right, moving forward in five, four, three, two, one. All right, so now we are looking at a proof, right? So when you are looking at a proof, the first thing that we should analyze is our. One more time. Our given information. So that is AC is perpendicular to BD and then AB is congruent to AD. So that information is already labeled for you as well on the two column proof. So you have cleared that. Next, you would check what you are trying to prove. So that is also labeled for you. So you would move on from there. And next, it says ACB and ACD are right angles. What do we know about right angles? They measure 90 degrees, right? That's just the definition for them. That's the rule that is given for them. So the answer here would be the definition of right angles. Next, it says that AC is congruent to AC, right? That would be the? Reflexive property of congruence, guys. So that is definitely one that you need to know moving into this test. 100% reflexive property of congruence is one of the more tested subjects in this exam, along with vertical angles. So make sure that you are paying attention to those. And lastly, it says that ABC is congruent to ADC, right? So when you're looking for this shortcut, you can realize that one, you have a side length, two, you have a, another side length, and three, you have an angle measure. Side so angle side. for your congruency statement, you would look at side angle side in this situation. All right. So that is all I have for you guys regarding trigonometry. Is there any last minute questions you might have about this chapter in particular or any others um, outside of this unit? All right, guys. Well, if you have nothing else for me, you can close up your stuff.